Hello YouTube and welcome back to another book review from me, your host, Logan Albright. And today I am talking about the first book of swords by Fred Saberhagen. As you know, I have been trying to read more classic fantasy. I'm trying to learn about the genre and immerse myself in some of the greats. I've got a reading list that I put together from some websites and some recommendations from authors that I like, seeing what people say is good. And I thought I would check out Fred Saberhagen because who doesn't love swords? Swords are great. I, uh, in high school, the only sport that I've ever had any interest in was fencing, and I used to fence in high school because I love swords. And how can you not? They're just magnificent instruments. They're wonderful, and I want to read anything about swords. Um, this book was written in 1983. It's the first of a series of three books in this sword saga, and then there's uh, the Books of Lost Swords, which is a longer series that he did after that along the same lines, if I'm not mistaken. And the conceit of these books is that the gods... For reasons of their own, because God's gonna God, uh, have commissioned Vulcan to forge 12 magic swords, which are then distributed to the people. And each sword has a different set of powers, and they are very powerful and interesting, and people want these swords. The people, uh, movers and shakers of this medieval world that this takes place in, hear about the swords, and they want to get their hands on them, because whoever possesses the swords can do great things with them. So, I think that's a cool premise. Uh, apparently it was de developed as an idea for a video game that Fred Saberhagen had, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you have a video game with swords in it, that's an obvious selling point. I think there's really something to this kind of idea of gamification of fantasy. I think that is something that, uh, can make the genre really work well. When, uh, people can kind of put themselves into the story and imagine themselves playing a part in it as if they were playing a video game. Uh, I think that's really useful. And you can see it in things like Harry Potter, where you have the different houses. You're like, which house do I belong to? Let me kind of uh, imagine myself in the story and assign myself a certain role based on that. You can see it in superhero things. What kind of powers would I want to have? What kind of superhero would I want to be? Having the 12 swords with 12 different powers is something that users can or readers can then imagine themselves or players that are game can imagine themselves. What Which of the 12 swords would I want to have? Which of these powers would be useful to me? And you can kind of... You know, if you're a kid, you can play with your friends and you can imagine yourself uh, each having a different sword. And you can have uh, imaginative play uh, along those lines. So it makes a lot of sense. The video game never materialized, but it left us with a series of books. Um, these books are written a little bit younger than most of the stuff I read on this channel. I'd say that this target audience is probably like teenage boys, like 13 to 15, something like that. So the story is a little simpler it is a little less uh, adult and a little less complex, but enjoyable nevertheless. And the story kind of follows this young boy named Mark, who is uh, inherits one of these swords from his father and has to go out into the wide world and avoid the clutches of the evil duke who's trying to get it from him. And along the way, he meets other people and encounters other swords, and you find out more about this world and the gods and what's going on uh, with the swords. Now, there's a couple things in the world that are worth mentioning. There are dragons, first of all. Always a fantasy staple. You've got to have dragons in your fantasy book. I've never personally been that interested in dragons. They're not a fantasy creature that really appeals to me in the same way that like fairies and elves and goblins and stuff and dwarves appeal to me. Dragons are okay, but they're just kind of like animals. Um, doesn't do much for me, but there's dragons. There's also giants, which is great. Gotta love giants. And then there are, of course, the gods. One nitpick I have something that kind of bothers me as a uh, as a nerd, essentially, is they sort of mix the Greek and Roman pantheons. Vulcan is the one who forges the swords, but later on we meet Hermes. You know, it should be Mercury if it's going to be the Roman pantheon. Vulcan should be Hephaestus if it's the Greek pantheon. So that mixing of the different Greek and Roman traditions is a little bit annoying. But, uh, it's you know, it's not trying to be faithful to one of those things. It's not, like, set in Greece. It's not set in Rome. So I guess that's forgivable. But I don't like that stuff as a rule. I like you to, you know, pick a pantheon and stick with it. Um, but, you know, we follow Mark. And then the story kind of branches out as Mark meets other people. And you start following other characters as well. And uh, over the course of the book, we only find out about a handful of the swords. I think there's four swords that are mentioned in the book. And so there's eight more that we don't really know anything about. And so those are presumably left for the sequels. Um, but you are following the different people who have these swords and you're introduced to more and more characters. So I was a little bit surprised because I assumed that we were gonna have the classic, like here's our protagonist, let's follow him on his story. 
and he sort of disappears halfway through the book. I mean, he, he's still in there. He doesn't disappear entirely, but there's so much of the book that's been devoted to other characters that are not Mark. I found that a little bit odd, but I guess that's if you're going to deal with swords that have been distributed across the world in this way, that's one thing you can do with it. And uh, I understand that there are a lot more characters in the books that follow. Um, one thing I really liked is the way the gods are treated, apart from the Pantheon thing. Uh, I like... I, one thing I love about mythology, Greek and Roman mythology, Norse mythology, all these things, is how kind of petty and undeserving of worship the gods are. They're powerful, but they're basically petulant children for the most part. And the best thing you can do in these worlds is avoid being noticed. It's not like you want to suck up to the gods and get on their good side, because if you do get noticed and get on their good side, then when the gods fight each other, whichever god you're in best with, their enemies are going to come after you. And that happens all the time in Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and Norse mythology. Um, keep your head down and don't get noticed is the moral of the story. And that is very much uh, that tradition is very much upheld in this book, because the gods are basically capricious, cruel, unfeeling things that are they're. Um, conducting some sort of game among the mortals because they're bored and they have these swords forged and distributed to basically sow conflict. And we don't find out in this book what the precise nature of the game that they want is, uh, what their actual goals are, but it's clear that it's going to involve a lot of human suffering and a lot of death. And that's just the way the gods are. And I think that's great. I don't like, uh, you know, having the gods be put on too high of a pedestal and being treated as too noble, I think kind of bringing them down to a human level where they're petty and insecure and have these foibles the same way they are in all the original stories of Greek and Roman mythology, I think that's great. So that's one of the things I liked about the book is that, you know, people are being used as tools of these more powerful beings, but not more moral beings. They're beings that are just not, you know, kind of amoral um, and they do what they want to do for their own amusement and we just have to deal with it and try to circumvent that. So that's an interesting concept. I don't think I liked this book as much as I had hoped to like it. I felt like the premise is really great, and I felt like the ideas behind it were really interesting, but I didn't really connect with the characters as much as I hoped I would. I found the shifting viewpoints a little bit distracting. I wanted to kind of follow one character further, because it's not that long of a book. The edition I have is about 200 pages, um, and I felt like I needed the time with the characters that we had instead of continuing to branch off and learn about other people. So I, I was a little bit distracted by the shifting focus. I didn't feel like I got to fall in love with the characters as much as I would have liked to. And the writing level, although, you know, perfectly competent, is a little bit, you know, younger than I tend to like to read. So um, I wasn't in love with this book, but if you are interested in magic swords and you like, you know, kind of teenage boy fantasy, uh, I think this was certainly a worthy one. It's got many other volumes in the series that you can then go on and read and learn more about the swords. Some of them sound pretty interesting. Uh, there is a poem in the back of the book, which kind of has 12 stanzas and lists kind of the qualities of each sword, even though we don't get introduced to them in this book. You kind of can get a sense for what the different swords do. And there's this sort of got to collect them all Pokemon feel where you're like, I want to find out what the rest of the swords do. I want to keep reading and see what, what happens with them. I probably won't continue the series, at least not right now. I've got other things to do, but I, I mean, I think the ideas behind it are really interesting and perhaps it gets better as it goes along. I was very much reminded of like the Elric saga because that's very focused around a magic sword. The tradition of magic swords in fantasy is a long and uh, prestigious one. So you can't really go wrong with that. It's always a nice thing. So that's what I thought of the first book of swords by Fred Saberhagen. If you've read it, please let me know what you think. If you think I should continue the series, uh, if the other books are better than the first one. Um, like I said, great ideas, not executed as well as I would have liked. There's a marching band across the street from me you may be able to hear. Uh, I'll just have to hope that you enjoy that and not and are not annoyed by it. Uh, I'll be back next week with another book review. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be, but it'll be something fun, I'm sure. Uh, in the meantime, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave me comments down below telling me how you feel and what you think. I love your comments. It's always nice to chat with you guys. And I'll return next week with another book review. Thank you so much for watching. I've been your host, Logan Albright, and I will catch you next time.